Hello, and welcome to BrainFacts.org and to the Animal Brain portion of the Brain Awareness Week online webinar. The full webinar was part of Brain Awareness Week, an international event to celebrate neuroscience and the brain. Check out the other portions of the presentation to learn about human brain anatomy and function, and to try some fun neuroscience activities at home. I am Nick Hobbs, a postdoctoral research associate in the neuroscience program at Michigan State University. First, a little test. Look at this picture. Can you determine which of these pictures doesn't belong? If you guessed the sea sponge, you'd be correct. But now the tough question, why is the sponge the odd man out here? Contrary to what many people think, the sponge is not a plant. It's an invertebrate animal, but it is the only animal that does not have a nervous system. The sponge can sense and react to changes in its environment, but it does so without the use of neurons. All other critters in the animal kingdom possess some form of nervous tissue, whether a nerve net or a highly complex brain. The nervous system provides a means for an animal to interact with its environment, whether it is finding food, attracting mates, or avoiding predators. Let's take a brief journey through the diversity of the nervous system. The following is a simplified phylogenetic tree showing the relationship among several major animal groups and should not be considered complete. Also note that this tree takes into account the whole organism, not only the nervous systems, which is where we are going to focus. As mentioned, sponges are the only species in the animal kingdom that do not have some sort of nervous tissue. This red line, then, is going to indicate the development of a nervous system. Next, let's examine the way the nervous system is organized in some invertebrate species. First, we have the cnidarians, which includes jellyfish. These animals have a simple nerve net, which is structured exactly as it sounds. Neurons are distributed around the body in a net-like fashion and are responsible for both sensation and motor function which is unlike higher level systems that have neurons dedicated specifically to sensory input and others dedicated specifically to motor output. Another group of invertebrates is the nematodes, or roundworms, which include C. elegans, an organism whose entire connectome, the neurons and all their connections, has been determined. There are 302 neurons and about 7,000 connections in the C. elegans nervous system. Neurons have been divided by action, sensory, motor, or interneuron, and scientists are continuing to examine neural circuits associated with specific behaviors. Understanding the entire nervous system of a microscopic worm may seem strange, but learning more about basic circuits and connections can give insights into mechanisms used by our much more complex human brain, which can improve our understanding of neuronal processes and improve research techniques which can then lead to the discovery of novel therapies for neurological diseases. While it may seem relatively simple, the nervous system of the starfish is surprisingly complex, consisting of a central nerve ring and radial nerves branching onto each of the arms. Even without having any well-defined sensory organs, starfish are sensitive to touch, light, temperature, orientation, and chemicals, allowing the starfish to detect odor sources. The presence of the central nerve ring allows for more complex behaviors than a neural net throughout the body. We've looked at some nervous system organization in invertebrates. Now, let's examine diversity within vertebrates. This red line indicates the development of a spinal cord and vertebrae. Vertebrates include animals from the lamprey, or jawless fish, all the way up to mammals. As you can see here, the overall structure of the vertebrate brain is highly conserved, unlike the invertebrates which had drastic differences in organization. These models show structural similarities and differences among the different species. At the bottom of the brain is the medulla, which regulates numerous autonomic functions, such as breathing and heart rate, and as such, is highly conserved. The pink region is the cerebellum, which, as we saw with humans, plays an important role in motor control and balance. The midbrain, depicted in blue, is associated with vision, hearing, and, and some motor functions. In non-mammalian species, 
the midbrain is the dominant region for visual processing. In mammals, there remains an evolutionarily old visual system in the midbrain, but primary control of visual processing is located in the occipital lobe in the cerebrum. The midbrain is also the region that contains the dopamine neurons that degrade in Parkinson's disease in humans. Each species has a cerebrum and areas like the hypothalamus and thalamus, which are shown in yellow. Although the general overall structure remains conserved within vertebrates, it is pretty easy to see that there are significant differences between the brains as well. One of the most obvious differences is that of brain shape. Take for example the alligator compared to the pigeon. You can see the olfactory bulbs in the alligator brain are located quite a distance from the rest of the cerebrum. The olfactory bulbs are able to project out because of the skull shape of the alligator with its long snout. The pigeon, on the other hand, has a very compact brain, similar to the small, round head of the bird. Scientists use endocast, a mold of the inside of the skull, to study the brain of extinct animals like the dinosaurs and human ancestors. Skull shape can give us insights about brain structure. Another shape difference can be seen by comparing primates to rodents and is the orientation of the cerebellum and spinal cord in relation to the cerebrum. In rodents, the cerebellum is behind the cerebrum, whereas in primates it has shifted to be more underneath the cerebrum. This shows how the brain has adapted to bipedal movement in primates. Looking at specific brain regions, we continue to see species differences. On the left is the lamprey larva and on the right a pigeon. Notice the striking differences in the pink region, which is the cerebellum. So why would these two animals have such different structures? Let's recall that the cerebellum is important for motor coordination and balance. A lamprey larva is a filter feeder living burrowed in the river floor. As such, they do not require much motor activity to survive. Pigeons are a completely different story. Flying is a complex motor skill requiring a great deal of coordination across many muscles. Therefore, this species has developed a cerebellum that takes up a large portion of overall brain size. As this example shows, brain structure is linked to brain function. Continuing with that concept, we can see the size of the olfactory bulb differs greatly between species as well. Here we compare a rodent and a primate, both mammals but quite different in behavior and as we see structure. The gray squirrel on the left has a large olfactory bulb which is used for processing odors and pheromones, chemical signals used by animals to communicate. The squirrel monkey, on the other hand, has a very small olfactory bulb. Primates, including humans, use a combination of visual and auditory stimuli to find food in mates and avoid predators, whereas rodents, like the squirrel, rely heavily on olfactory signaling. As such, primates have a much smaller olfactory bulb, but a more developed occipital and temporal lobe. But, as we see, olfactory bulb size also varies between mammals. Many people wonder if there's a specific brain characteristic that is correlated with intelligence. The first possibility would be brain size, but if that were the case, humans would be less intelligent than elephants or whales. This isn't the case, but when brain size is compared relative to body size, humans come out on top. Until you add in a primate like the marmoset. So what characteristic is most closely related to intelligence? Cerebral cortex cell number seems to be a contender. So how is it that humans can fit three times as many neurons in the cerebral cortex compared to elephants in a brain that is a quarter of the volume? The answer is cortex folding. As animals increase the neuron number and therefore volume of their cerebrum, they are limited by the size of their skulls. As such, selection has favored the folding of the cerebrum to increase surface area giving more space to the outer regions of the cortex where the neuron cell bodies lie. As we see here, the dog has a much higher level of cerebral folding compared to the rabbit. We can see a similar trend for two aquatic mammals, the manatee and the dolphin. In both comparisons, the animals with the higher degree of cerebral folding are associated with a greater level of intelligence. 
Thank you for watching the Animal Brains portion of our Brain Awareness Week online webinar. Hello and welcome to BrainFacts.org and to the Human Brain portion of the Brain Awareness Week online webinar. The full webinar was part of Brain Awareness Week, an international event to celebrate neuroscience and the brain. Check out the other portions of the presentation to learn about animal brain anatomy and function, and to learn some fun neuroscience activities at home. I am Zachary Grebe, a graduate student in the neuroscience program at Michigan State University. We are going to learn about the human brain, and I wanted to start with one of my favorite brain-related quotes by Joel Davis. The human brain is the last and greatest scientific frontier. To begin looking at this complex organ, let's go over some of its basic structures and their functions. First, the largest part of the human brain is the cerebrum, which literally means brain in Latin. It is composed of the left and right cerebral hemispheres and underlying brain regions. It controls many functions, including sensory processing, or how we perceive our world, emotions, speech and communication, and critical thinking, such as solving problems in school, on the sports field, or between friends. Just below the cerebrum, we can see the cerebellum, which in Latin means little brain. It also has a right and left hemisphere, similar to the cerebrum, but it is most well known for its involvement in the coordination of motor movements. You might recall hearing a recent story of a man amazingly born without a cerebellum. As expected, he did have balance and motor difficulties, but he also had trouble with clear thinking and emotion, which suggests the cerebellum might help coordinate more cognitive functions than was originally believed. This just goes to show that there's always more to learn about the brain. So now let's take a closer look at the cerebral hemispheres, which are broken up into four different lobes. Starting with the front of the brain, we first see the frontal lobe, which plays an important role in higher cognitive level functions, such as planning, critical thinking, and understanding consequences of our behaviors. These functions are associated with the prefrontal cortex, which interestingly is one of the last brain regions to fully develop. In fact, the prefrontal cortex might not be fully developed until an individual reaches their mid-20s, and experts think that this might explain why teens are more likely to participate in risky behaviors than adults. The prefrontal cortex is also associated with the inhibition of impulsive behaviors, and many medicines that are used to treat attentional deficit disorders, such as ADD and ADHD, target the frontal lobe. Additionally, along with higher level cognitive functions, the frontal lobe is also involved in the planning and control of motor functions. The primary motor cortex shown here is responsible for the execution of voluntary motor movements. The second lobe that we come across is the parietal lobe, named for the parietal bone of the skull. The somatosensory cortex shown in pink, is dedicated to processing the sense of touch. The cortex actually contains a map of our body with more sensitive areas like your hands, taking up a larger portion of the somatosensory cortex than less sensitive areas like your legs or torso. Furthermore, you might already know that the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body and vice versa. And this is true in the somatosensory cortex as well. Touch on your right hand will activate neurons on your left cerebral hemisphere. The parietal lobe is also very important in proprioception, considered our sixth sense. You might not have heard of proprioception before, so let's do a quick demonstration to explain the concept. First, close your eyes. Next, place both hands out in front of you. Now clap your hands. What you should have noticed is that it was fairly easy to clap your hands together without missing. Proprioception is being able to sense where your body is in space, and it is very important for many things we do every day, like walking. 
Imagine trying to walk while having to constantly look at every single movement that you make with your legs and feet. The next major lobe is the temporal lobe, named after its location beneath the temples. This lobe is very important in auditory processing, olfaction or smell, and memory. Understanding and producing speech is another function controlled by the temporal lobe, and speech is partially localized to Wernicke's area, which is located only in the left hemisphere. Damage to this region can result in a condition called fluent aphasia, in which the individual can string words together and the tone, cadence, and speed of the speech is normal, but the resulting sentence has no meaning. The words simply don't go together. Similarly, these individuals are also unable to understand written or spoken language. The fusiform gyrus, which is located near the bottom of the temporal lobe, is another interesting region. Damage to this area can result in, a, in prosopagnosia or facial blindness. This results in impairment in the ability to recognize faces, including the individual's own face, without affecting any other visual abilities. Individuals with facial blindness often must rely on hair, clothing, voice, or other cues to identify people. The final lobe is the occipital lobe, which is derived from Latin and literally means behind the head. The occipital lobe is vital for visual processing, and we can demonstrate this by using optical illusions. When you look at this image, which square, either A or B, looks darker to you. Likely you think it looks like square A is darker, but if we actually compare these squares side by side, we can see that they are in fact the same shade of gray. Why does this occur? This illusion illustrates that our visual system needs to quickly discern between different colors or shades in our environment. One possible explanation takes into account the local contrast of the image. Our brain determines that square B is light gray because of the contrast with the dark square surrounding it, but square A is dark gray because it is surrounded by lighter squares. So even though A and B are the same shade, they appear different because of the comparison to neighboring squares. However, scientists are still studying how exactly optical illusions work. The interesting concept here though is that how we perceive the world is completely dependent upon our brain, and this is a great example of that. Those two gray boxes are the same shade, but our brain tells us that's not the case, so we perceive them as different shades. Next, we will go into more detail of the subcortical areas of the brain and their functions. These are regions located below the cerebral cortex, Whereas the cortex is involved in higher cognitive functioning, these regions tend to play a role in functions that are considered evolutionarily older. For example, the expression of fear, regulating hunger, and our breathing. In particular, we will cover the corpus callosum, the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, the pineal gland, the brainstem, the hippocampus, and finally, the amygdala. In most ways, the two hemispheres are similar, but they do need to communicate with each other for the brain to function normally. The hemispheres communicate by way of the corpus callosum, which in Latin means tough body. It is composed of axons, the parts of the neuron responsible for sending signals to other neurons. So think of the corpus callosum as the telephone wires which allow you to call a close friend. Sometimes, patients who suffer from very severe seizures and who do not respond to less invasive treatments will have their corpus callosum cut, what is known as a split brain procedure. This results in a fascinating condition. First, remember that the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and vice versa. Additionally, recall that Wernicke's area, which is important for speech production, is only located in the left temporal lobe. For split brain patients, if they touch or hold an apple in their left hands, they will not be able to tell you what the object is. 
the presence of the apple would be processed by the right parietal lobe, but the speech center is in the left temporal lobe. Since the two hemispheres cannot communicate, the left hemisphere would not receive any information about the object. The hypothalamus, which literally means below the thalamus, is an area of the brain that is important in the control of many endocrine or hormonal systems in the body, all while being about the size of an almond. The pituitary gland, also known as the master gland, contains tissues that produce many hormones and is located just below the hypothalamus. It is about the size of a pea in humans, and in this picture, the pituitary is represented by a green dot. While the hypothalamus controls many different hormonal functions, today I'm going to talk about its role in the stress response. First, when you experience a stressful situation, such as taking the SAT, your hypothalamus responds by releasing a hormone into tiny blood vessels which lead directly to the pituitary gland. When this hormone reaches the pituitary gland, it causes the pituitary to start producing a different hormone which is released into the blood where it travels to the adrenal cortex located just on top of the kidneys. When it reaches the adrenal cortex, it causes the release of cortisol, the stress hormone. Once in the blood, cortisol causes the release of glucose, the sugar our body uses for energy, into the bloodstream and shuts down our immune system and gastrointestinal system, among many other functions. This system is called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or HPA axis for short. And why this cortisol response to stress was particularly important for our ancestors' survival, by activating their flight or flight response in dangerous situations, today, chronic stress is an unhealthy situation which can put people at risk for heart disease and other illnesses due to the suppression of their immune systems. The pineal gland is a small hormone gland known for secreting melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that most notably controls sleep timing. In darkness, the pineal gland produces more melatonin and promotes sleep. Indeed, it is so sensitive to light patterns that there are differences in secretion between the long days of summer and the shorter days of winter. Quite interestingly, the pineal gland is one of the few brain regions that doesn't have the blood-brain barrier, which protects most other brain regions. This makes the pineal gland more vulnerable to blood-borne toxins or foreign substances like bacteria. The pineal gland also has an interesting history, as in the past it was considered the area from which the soul interacted with the physical body. In fact, the famous philosopher René Descartes called the pineal gland the principal seat of the soul. The brainstem is the last section of the brain before it connects to the spinal cord. It has three main parts, which are the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. The midbrain contains many different types of neurons, including serotonin and dopamine neurons. These midbrain dopamine neurons are important for reward and motor movements. And today we will talk a bit about the dopamine neurons involved in motor function. These dopamine neurons are part of the substantia nigra, which in Latin means black substance, due to the darker shades of these cells when compared to nearby areas. These neurons are particularly interesting because the neurodegenerative Parkinson's disease is characterized by a substantial loss of these neurons. This loss results in the typical movement deficits of Parkinson's disease, such as tremor and difficulty walking. Therefore, many current Parkinson's disease treatments have been made to try and replace this lost dopamine signal in the midbrain. The second major part of the brainstem is the pons, which translates to bridge. This translation generally explains its function quite well, in fact. The pons is made up of many axons that travel from the cerebrum to the cerebellum, as well as from sensory neurons traveling to the thalamus, similar to an overpass on a highway. The third major part of the brainstem is the medulla oblongata, perhaps the most fun brain region to pronounce. The medulla is incredibly important because it controls many functions that we don't even think about, like our breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure. Really, the basic functions for living. In fact, it is possible to live with just the brainstem intact. 
A fascinating story showing this phenomenon is that of Mike the Headless Chicken. One day, when Mike's owners tried to behead him, they failed to hit the jugular vein and the brainstem. The result was that Mike was able to live an additional 18 months with close monitoring. Mike was closely monitored because he was unable to actually eat on his own due to the lack of a motor cortex, but the brainstem was still controlling his basic bodily functions needed for survival, such as his breathing and heart rate. The hippocampus, which means seahorse, due to the similarity between its shape and the animal, has two major roles. First, it is important in the long-term consolidation of memories, demonstrated by the fascinating case of patient HM. HM had most of his hippocampi surgically removed to stop severe seizures from which he was suffering. The unintentional consequences of the surgery was that HM then suffered from severe anterograde amnesia, meaning that he can no longer form long-term memories. For example, he would meet a doctor and then just a short while later have no memory of the person. Perhaps you have seen the movies Memento, 50 First Dates, or Finding Nemo, which popularized this phenomenon. The most interesting part, though, of the HM case was that he was still able to learn motor memories like playing a piano, even though he was unable to tell you where he learned that new skill. The second major function of the hippocampus is spatial navigation. Interestingly, the hippocampus seems to increase in size based on its own use. And in fact, there was a study that found that taxi drivers in London who have to pass an extremely vigorous test demonstrating their knowledge of all the streets in London were found to have a larger hippocampi than bus drivers who follow a limited path daily. Additionally, degeneration of the hippocampus is one of the first areas of the brain to be affected during Alzheimer's disease. It is the degeneration of this region which leads to the characteristic symptoms of memory loss and disorientation in early Alzheimer's disease patients. The amygdala, which in Latin means almond due to its shape, is an area important in the regulation of emotions. In particular, the amygdala helps us to consolidate memories associated with strong emotions, such as getting into the college that you hope for, or from tragedies in our lives. The phenomenon in which we can remember clearly what we were doing during a societal tragedy, such as the Kennedy assassination, the Challenger explosion, September 11th, or the Boston Marathon bombing, is known as a flashbulb memory. Interestingly, while flashbulb memories are more vivid, they aren't necessarily more accurate, but they show that emotion can play an important role in memory formation, which makes sense given its location just in front of the hippocampus, our memory center. The amygdala is also important in evaluating the salience or importance of a situation. For instance, when we look at frightened faces, our amygdala is more active than when we see neutral faces. It makes sense that we would want to pay attention to a scared face, as this could signal to us a potential threat, perhaps an out-of-control car. However, the amygdala can sometimes be overactive, and this is often seen in patients with social anxiety disorders and depression. Thank you guys for joining for my section on the human brain. I hope you learned a lot about this fascinating organ and some of its many functions. Hello, and welcome to brainfacts.org and to the at-home activity portion of the Brain Awareness Week online webinar. The full webinar was part of Brain Awareness Week, an international event to celebrate neuroscience and the brain. Check out the other portions of the presentation to learn about human and animal brain anatomy and function. I am Casey Henley, the online programs coordinator and faculty outreach co-coordinator for the neuroscience program at Michigan State University. So let's dive into three hands-on activities that allow us to see the brain in action. Can you think of a time that you've had to act quickly, almost without thinking? Maybe a friend tossed something your way when you weren't completely paying attention. Or maybe it's when you hit your alarm off as fast as possible this morning. 
or perhaps you stop the game-tying soccer goal or hit the game-winning fastball out of the park. All of these require lightning-fast reactions, and today we are going to test how fast your reaction time is. I would like to point out that your reaction time is different from a reflex. Reflexes, like the patella reflex seen during the knee tap test at the doctor's office, are automatic, involuntary responses that involve the spinal cord, but not the brain. A reaction, however, is much more complex neurological pathway. It involves decision-making processes and therefore requires input from the brain. So let's try it at home. To prepare, you will need a ruler, or if you have younger participants, a yardstick works great. Something with which to jot down your results and at least one friend. So let's get testing. Have your friend hold the ruler near the top end and let it hang down with the zero inches mark at the bottom. Place your index finger and thumb at the bottom of the ruler, ready to grab the ruler when dropped. But don't touch the ruler. Once you are ready to catch the ruler, your friend should drop it. Once you see the ruler start to drop, catch it between your two fingers. Record the level, inches or centimeters, at which you caught the ruler. Test yourself three times. Your friend should vary when he or she drops the ruler. By waiting a few seconds, it makes it more difficult for you to guess when the ruler will drop. After three times, switch places. Once you have your distances written down, you can determine the actual time it took you to react to the falling ruler. This table is also included at the resources at the end of the webinar as well. So what is happening in your brain during this process? Well, your neurons are communicating. But really, what does that mean? Neurons are the basic units of the brain. They are specialized for sending electrical signals over long distances and are electrically and chemically excitable. The typical neuron consists of the cell body, dendrites, the axon, and presynaptic terminals. Dendrites are short processes that branch out in a tree-like fashion. They are the main target for incoming signals received from the axons of other cells. The number of inputs a neuron receives depends on the complexity of the dendritic branching. Unlike the branching characteristics of the dendrites, the axon is usually a long, single process and begins at the cell body at the axon hillock. The axon may travel a very short distance, for example, a few hundred micrometers as an interneuron between two other neurons or it can travel a very long distance. For example, a meter, if it's a sensory neuron in your big toe and has to travel all the way up to your spinal cord. Axons can branch in order to communicate with more than one target cell. The axon transmits an electrical signal called an action potential from the axon hillock all the way to the presynaptic terminal where the electrical signal will result in a release of chemical neurotransmitters to communicate with the next cell. Many axons are also covered by a myelin sheath, which increases the speed of the action potential. The axon terminates at the presynaptic terminal or terminal bouton. These presynaptic terminals is where the neurotransmitter release occurs. The presynaptic terminal of the axon forms a synapse with another neuron known as the postsynaptic cell. Most commonly, axons contact dendrites, but it is possible for axons to communicate with cell bodies or even other axons. Let's take a closer look at the synapse. When an action potential arrives in the presynaptic axon terminal, 
the neurotransmitter molecules are released from synaptic vesicles into the synaptic cleft. The postsynaptic region of a synapse contains receptors that are activated by the release of the neurotransmitter. The activation can cause the postsynaptic cell to initiate an action potential. So there is an electrical to chemical back to electrical signal transformation of information during neuronal communication. So in the reaction test, visual information of the ruler dropping reaches your eye. Your retina then sends this information to the visual cortex located in the occipital lobe in the back of your brain. This info then makes its way to the frontal lobe where the decision-making process occurs. You know you need to catch the ruler. The instructions then head to the motor cortex where information is sent out to motor neurons that reside in the spinal cord and then to your hand muscles to catch the ruler. All of that in less than a quarter of a second. That's pretty amazing. So now that you've completed the basic reaction time test, here are some alternative options you can do at home after the webinar. In the previous activity, you watched the ruler drop, and that is how you knew when to catch it. So instead, close your eyes. Then, when your friend drops the ruler, he or she should say the word drop, and then you catch the ruler. Or, your friend can tap your foot to indicate when you should catch it. So how does the reaction time change in these different scenarios? What happens when the sensory information comes in through your ears instead of your eyes? And what are the new pathways? You can also turn reaction time tests into a game. Compete with your friends or compare parents and kids scores. Or you can try to improve your times after practice. You can also try catching with your non-dominant hand and see how your time changes. And of course, you can always come up with your own ideas. So let's move on to our next at-home activity, examining touch and perception. We all know the five main senses, sight, smell, taste, hearing, and touch. In actuality, there are more than just these five. Often thirst and hunger are considered senses, as is your sense of balance and proprioception the ability to know where your body is in space. Our senses are how we interact with the environment. If you think about our nervous system in simplistic terms, there is an input, our senses, processing that occurs in the central nervous system, and an output, our behavior. Without sensory input, we would not know how to react to our world. For this activity, we are going to focus on the sense of touch. Touch can encompass a number of different sensations, pressure, vibration, itch, pain, temperature, and sometimes these are each considered their own sense. The way we are able to sense all of these different feelings is through the presence of special receptors in the skin. Each receptor is located in a specific layer of skin and each measures a specific type of tactile sensation. The receptors convert a mechanical signal, such as pressure and skin stretch, into electrical signals within the sensory neuron that travels to the spinal cord and then sends signals up to the brain. In the brain, the information is processed by the somatosensory cortex, shown here in pink. This sensory transduction is a common principle of all sensory systems. A stimulus, could be light or sound or touch, activates a specialized receptor, which in turn sends an electrical signal, the action potential, down the axon. After the receptor is activated, the process of signal transduction is like that which we saw earlier, electrical signal, to chemical signal, to electrical signal. In the brain, 
the somatosensory cortex has a somatotopic map of our body. If you feel something with your fingers, neurons in this area will become active. As you've probably experienced, some parts of your body are more sensitive than others. Sensitivity is dependent on the density of receptors present in an area of skin. The more receptors, the more sensitive the area. More receptors in the skin also leads to a larger area of the somatosensory cortex being dedicated to that region. For example, look at how large the cortex area is for the fingers compared to the rest of the arm. How do you think other regions of the body compare in sensitivity? Well, to answer that question, we're going to do another activity. For this activity, you will need a paper clip, a ruler, some paper, and a pen or pencil, and your friend. One way to determine sensitivity of an area of skin is to test its two-point discrimination. So first, straighten out and then bend your paper clip into a U. Put the arms close together. Then close your eyes and have your friend touch the paper clip gently to your arm. Tell your friend if you can feel one point or two. If only one point is felt, your friend should pull the arms of the paper clip apart a little. Again, state if you can feel one or two distinct points. Your friend should keep pulling the arms of the paper clip apart until you are able to feel two separate points. Once you feel two points, measure the distance between the paper clip arms and record it. Test multiple spots on your body, your fingertips, the back of your hand, your arm, your lips, your back, your leg, and your foot. After you complete all of the regions, test each one more time. Then compare the different regions. Which areas had the smallest distance between the two points? Why do you think this is? After the webinar, try some of these alternative activities. Cool the areas of skin with an ice cube before testing the two-point discrimination. Or see who is more sensitive, parents or kids or boys or girls. And finally, create your own homunculus. A homunculus is a 3D representation of the somatotopic map in the brain. You can create your own homunculus at home. Simply take your two-point discrimination results and use this equation. Five times one over your result in centimeters. This will give you your size for that body part in your homunculus. For example, if your threshold for your fingertips was 3 millimeters, or 0.3 centimeters, then 5 times 1 over 0.3 is 16.67. So you should make your fingers about 16 centimeters in length. Do this for all of your two-point discrimination results, and you will have your own funny homunculus to show off. And now on to our final activity. By now, we all know how cool and important the brain is. Taking care of our brain is really important. If it gets injured, the brain doesn't heal like other parts of the body. So protecting it from damage is critical. Let's do an activity where we can learn about the brain's natural protection. To follow along with our demonstration, you will need one or preferably two jars. The 16 ounce glass mason jars work really well. A couple of eggs and some water. This demonstration can get a little messy, so make sure you check with your parent or guardian before starting. Our body provides some protection for the brain. Our strong skull protects external objects from being able to come into contact with our soft brain tissue. Poke your head, and your brain is totally safe. Do you think the skull is our only form of protection for the brain? Let's set up a demonstration to see. Get one of your jars and an egg. The jar is going to represent our skull and the egg our brain. 
Put the egg inside of the mason jar and screw on the lid tightly. Like our brain and our skull, the egg is safe from external objects. Now shake it up. Oh no, what a mess! Although the egg is safe from external objects, it's still not safe inside the jar. This is the same situation for our brain. Your brain isn't just hanging out inside your skull. Just imagine if the skull was the only protection. What would happen if you shook your head all around? You'd have a scrambled brain. Of course, we know that's not what happens in real life. Our brain has more protection inside our skulls with the presence of cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. Let's take a look at how this fluid helps protect our brain. Get a clean jar, or clean the messy one, and a new egg. Again, jar is our skull, egg is our brain. Put the egg in the jar, but this time, fill up the jar with water. This water is going to represent our CSF. Make sure the lid is on and shake up the egg. Did you notice a difference? The egg should be totally fine, or at least not as smashed as the egg with no water. The water protected the egg, just like our CSF protects our brain. Way to go, CSF! Now, CSF is great, and it does a wonderful job protecting our brain in normal, everyday situations. But sometimes we need to provide our brain with more protection. When riding bikes, skateboarding, playing sports, or participating in other similar activities, it is important to wear a helmet to prevent brain injury. Additionally, seat belts should always be worn in the car. A hard fall or forceful hit to the head can cause serious damage. Traumatic brain injuries are responsible for almost half a million visits to the emergency room annually for children under the age of 15. So keep that brain safe. If you want to keep making a mess after the webinar, you can make a helmet for your egg. See how extra protection can keep the egg intact. Definitely get permission before attempting this at home. Use materials you can find around the house like tape, bubble wrap, paper, styrofoam, etc. to protect your egg from a fall. After the egg is all bundled up, drop it to see if it breaks. It's best to drop the egg into a box or newspaper, and you can place the egg in a sandwich bag prior to putting on its helmet to contain the mess as much as possible. Thank you for watching the at-home activity portion of our Brain Awareness Week online webinar.